Welcome to another edition of Friday Night Live. Yes, we are now at the tip end of the year 2012, the Gregorian year. It's almost uh, coming to an end. The so-called New Year's Day or New Year's Night is just around the corner. Wherever you may be watching the program from uh, this evening, we welcome you. Some of you may be just uh, relaxing at home. Others may be on holiday and you may be watching from your holiday destination. Others may still be working, yes. The world doesn't come to a standstill. The country doesn't come to an absolute standstill during this part uh, of the year or this period of the year. Although this is the peak holiday week of the year. If you go and do timeshare booking or if you are looking for accommodation, you'll probably pay the most uh, for the last week uh, of the year. Uh, and that's the last week of uh, December. Nonetheless... Wherever you may be and whatever you may be doing, Allah wa ta'ala has blessed us with an opportunity once again, alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, to be able to talk to one another about the deen, to be able to discuss with one another about the teachings of Allah, the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the example of sahaba and the great teachings of the, our pious predecessors throughout uh, the ages. Now, we have been talking quite a bit in the last few programs about uh, tips for holidays because it's so relevant uh, to the period. And I spoke about uh, a six-point plan of action for holidays. And we've been through four. We spoke about niyyah and intention two weeks back. And I had mentioned then that um, if you have an intention as to why you're taking a break or why you're going on holiday or why you're taking your leave, then your intention, not only will you get rewarded as per your intention, and not only will be the, 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 the benefit be uh, proportionate to the intention, but it also help you remain focused. So if you're saying that I want to take a break to refresh my mind, to re-energize my batteries, to spend a little bit more time with my family, to catch up on some social visits that I didn't get much time for during the course of the year, then these are all noble intentions. You'll get rewarded for them, but at the same time, you'll also then get the benefit and you'll remain focused. Because again and again, I'm going to say this, a Muslim doesn't go on holiday from Islam. A Muslim can never go on holiday from uh, Islam. That is something that uh, we, need to, we need to be very, very cognizant of. And that is something that we need to be very, very uh, conscious of. Now, when we come back uh, from the break, inshallah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a few more introductory points uh, to that whole discussion that a Muslim does not go on a break from Islam. Uh, I explained to it to an extent in the last two weeks. I'm going to elaborate on it a little bit more this week. Then we'll go into the other features of the program. And uh, from the four points that we've discussed so far, from the six, point three and four, which we discussed last week, I want to elaborate a little bit more on it. And then we're going to go on to uh, points five and six, inshallah. Also coming up uh, this evening on Friday Night Live, we have our story for the week. We talk about Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and uh, the fire worshipper. We also have our nikah segment, marital tip for the week. Keep an eye on your spouse during the holidays. What do I mean? Well, wait for the feature and we'll discuss uh, inshallah. And then in our sunnah feature, we talk about sleeping after meals. So that's what you can look forward to this evening on Friday Night Live. <laughs> Welcome back to Friday Night Live. Now, as I said, a few more introductory points on this whole discussion of uh, the Muslims' approach towards holidays and towards uh, taking a break and towards uh, having a bit uh, of a relaxing period, if you want to call it that. Uh, then we'll recap on, on some of the points we've discussed previously and then uh, move on uh, to some of the points that we, are, that we have yet to discuss. Now, the one thing I want to mention up front, this word festive season, you see words have an impact on people. So everyone talks about the festive season, but this word festive season has an impact on the psyche. What happens is it, uh, it creates an impression that it's a period where you can't do anything constructive, you can't do anything uh, serious. So you'll hear many people saying, leave it for next year now, till after the holidays, till after school open. When we get back, uh, we'll, we'll look at it. So um, it puts you into a mood which can perhaps make you a little too uh, lethargic. I mentioned this previously, that uh, yes, you have to have a break uh, from some of the more serious things, where you do um, a, more, a, a bit more of relaxing things, 
get involved more in, in leisure activities. But uh, remember that in the broader scheme of things, in the bigger picture of life, don't just unnecessarily postpone and become unnecessarily lethargic simply because it's the so-called festive season. So let it not create a sense of uh, lethargy. And even worse, let it not create a sense of total uh, freedom. That, ah, now I can do what I want, but I can just uh, relax and I can laze around and I can uh, do whatever I want with my time. Uh, that, there's no consequence now. It's the, it's the off-season, so to speak. There's one verse of the quran Karim where Allah wa ta'ala mentions, وَمَنْ يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ نُقَيِّدْ لَهُ شَيْطَانًا فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٌ That... Uh, the, 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 the crux of this particular verse, the summary of this particular verse, is that once you become complacent and once you become negligent uh, from the remembrance of Allah wa ta'ala, then shaitan fills the vacuum. Shaitan comes in and fills the gap. Shaitan then takes advantage of the fact that uh, you are not remembering Allah wa ta'ala, not in words, nor in your actions. Your words and your actions are contradicting the instructions of Allah. Hence, you are classified as a negligent servant of Allah, not as a dhakir in the true sense, not as a remembering servant of Allah. And therefore, what happens is that uh, shaitan now has a gap, he has some room, he has some space, and he becomes your friend. So to the holiday period, or the so-called festive season, or your leave, that should not make you negligent of the command of Allah, because then you're opening up the door for the devil, you're opening up the door for shaitan. Abu Darda radiallahu an, a great sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to say, I entertain my mind with something trivial from time to time to strengthen it in the service of deen. Now, I've been mentioning this in, in different ways in the last few weeks, but in reality, the crux of the issue is this, the summary of the whole discussion, discussion is this, that a holiday is a means towards an, towards an objective, it's not an objective in itself. For example, when a human being goes to sleep at night, when a human being goes to take some rest, sleeping and resting is not an objective of life. You don't hear anyone who's got some sense and who's got some logic saying that one of my goals in life is to sleep. One of my goals in life is to rest. Nobody says that. But it's a means towards a goal. If you don't sleep every night, you won't be able to fulfill the goals and the tasks of the next day. So it's something you have to do. So similarly, like the body gets tired and it needs sleep at night, the mind also gets tired. So every now and again, depending on the person's circumstances, depending on the person's conditions and situ uh, situation, you need to do something differently. And you need to do things uh, a little bit uh, less serious so you can uh, give the mind a bit of, uh, of a break. But the recreation of the previous generations was not due to boredom. It was to train the soul and to re-energize the mind. So when they came back from that break, when they came back from that, uh, from that holiday, they could uh, achieve even more and they could uh, strive even more. So in reality, it's not an objective in itself. It's a means towards an objective. So we as Muslims cannot have a holiday where we're just doing things that are not refreshing our minds and not refreshing and re-energizing our spirits. Also, what is critical to remember, there's no holiday from death. Preparation for death has to be ongoing. Death can come at any time. Actually, there's a very fascinating and a very thought-provoking and in many ways a very inspiring incident of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, which I would like to share with you, which is very pertinent at this particular point. One day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam met Mu'adh radiallahu an and he asked him a question. And he said that, O oh, Mu'adh, how is your iman? What is the level of your iman? Now, generally, when we meet people, what do we say? How are you? How's the family? How's the business? And if you know somebody that's related to them, how's your uncle? How's your father? That kind of thing. But look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the sign of a true spiritual mentor. O oh, Mu'adh, what is the level of your iman? So Mu'adh radiallahu anh gives a very positive answer and says, Oh, uh, Ya Rasulullah, I, I, I'm of the opinion that my iman is sound. I am of the opinion that my iman is in good health. Is it in, it's, in, uh, it's in a good state. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam heard this, he said, Mu'adh, likulli shay'in haqiqah. There's a reality behind, behind everything. There needs to be evidence. It's easy for you to claim that your iman is good, it's sound, uh, it's, uh, it's healthy. But what's, what's the evidence of that? How do you come to that conclusion? On what do you base uh, your, uh, your, 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 your statement? So Mu'adh radiallahu anhu said, Ya Rasulullah, every morning when I wake up, I don't expect to see evening. And every evening when I go to bed, I don't expect to see morning. 
And I try and live my life in such a way that the akhirat, the everlasting life of the year after is always before me. I never lose focus of that objective. I never lose focus of that realization. Subhanallah. When he gave this answer, Allah, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that indeed, O Mu'adh, your iman is of good health and good standing and your iman is sound and healthy. So even if you are on a beachfront uh, in, a, in a nice hotel, relaxing there, even if you are at some international destination, even if you're just at home, you know, catching, catching your breath, so to speak, taking a few days off to relax, you can never lose sight of, of, of the year after. You can never lose sight of what your destination is as a believer, what your objective is as a believer. So even this holiday, even this break, it must be something which is facilitating and it must be something which is leading you towards an objective, not taking you away and diverting you away from that objective. Again, I'm saying, when we become negligent of the, of the remembrance of Allah, wa ta'ala, then we're opening the door for the devil. And uh, this happens more so during the holiday period. And when you open the door for the devil, he's in. You open it up for him an inch, and he'll then, he'll then push it open, and he'll keep it open. And then it's very difficult to shut it in his face. So those are a few introductory points I wanted to mention. Now in the last two weeks, what are some of the, the, the tips that we covered? The one was knee and intention, which I spoke about earlier on. The other, which we also discussed two weeks back, was salah. And we said that uh, salah is something which we neglect to a greater extent during holidays. But salah also, if performed correctly, tanha anil fahsha wal munkar, it protects you from all types of vice, evil and sin. And during the holiday period, during the break, we, in most cases, most instances, would be exposed to a great extent when it comes to vice and evil. And during the year, you, you, you're always in a rush, in and out of the masjid. Holiday time, take a little more uh, time out for your salah, put in a little bit more effort in your salah, and that salah will protect you and keep you away from vice and evil throughout uh, the holiday period. Then we spoke last week about uh, controlling the gaze. We said this is a great spiritual malady, it's a great spiritual challenge, but it's something that, uh, you know, it, the, the rewards are so tremendous. The greater the challenge, the greater the reward. And controlling the gaze becomes more of a challenge during the holiday period. And if you are able to succeed in this regard, the reward will be greater. And we spoke about it being an arrow from the arrows of the devil, and that it, uh, it's the window to the heart, it leads to other acts of promiscuity and ultimately adultery. And we also said the, the, the glad tidings given is فَفِيهِ إِشَارَةٌ إِلَىٰ حُسْنِ الْخَاتِمَةِ That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has promised that if you control your gaze for the pleasure of Allah, Allah will grant you the sweetness of iman. And the sweetness of iman is such that once you have been granted it, it will never be taken away from you, meaning you'll die with iman. So use that to motivate yourself. Use that to motivate yourself. That if I can control my gaze, I am actually securing death on iman, which is a huge objective and a huge goal and a huge accomplishment if it can be secured and attained by any believer, by any Muslim or Muslim. During the holiday period, uh, we also have to attend more weddings, more functions. And we know sometimes how people just, ya Allah, they totally lose the plot, you know, uh, in terms of how they dress, in terms of how they conduct themselves. So it becomes a greater challenge. Then we also spoke last week about time. And we said that uh, it doesn't mean that you're on holiday and you're involved in more social and more leisurely activities that uh, you can waste time. Time can never be wasted. You can be doing things differently. You can be doing different things. Uh, you can have a greater allocation for relaxation, but you cannot be wasting time. And we explained last week that you must also have a schedule, even for your holiday period, so you remain focused. Now, there are a few points I wanted to add on to that. There's the great uh, couplets in Urdu uh, that really summarizes the importance of time. It mentions... Subah hui, sham hui, umar yuhi, tamam hui. It was morning and then it was evening, it was morning again, it was evening and before I realized my life has passed me by. You know, sometimes you speak to uh, very elderly people, grandparents, great great parents. So I can remember the day I got married as if it was yesterday, man. I cannot believe how quickly this child has grown up, how quickly this grandchild of mine has grown up. I still consider myself young and I'm already a grandfather. I'm already a, grand, uh, a grandparent. Hassan Basri rahimahullah used to say, I found Sahaba more possessive over their time than they were over their wealth. I found Sahaba more possessive over their time than they were over their wealth. And it's not only the youth that waste time. They obviously find it a greater challenge, but sometimes also as adults, we waste a lot of time. You value time in the business environment. If your employee comes late, 
then you say, you know, five minutes you came late. If you come late five minutes every day, it becomes half an hour a week. It becomes two hours a month. If each one of you take two hours a month, we're losing a full day or for two days a month. And we know how to do all those calculations. But when it comes to our personal selves, we know and we've heard many times, every second that passes is a second that has passed away. It's not going to return but uh, we don't appreciate time and we don't value time. Even during the holidays, don't waste time. Don't waste time. That's it. Simple message. Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhum I used to say, if a, a day has passed in my life, if a day has passed in my life and that day doesn't bring me closer to my Allah, if a day has passed in my life and that day doesn't bring me closer to my Allah, then I consider that day to be a day of regret in my life. Allahu Akbar. So even during the holidays, every day ought to be a day that brings us closer to Allah. Every day ought to be a day that brings us closer to Allah. So we've discussed four out of those six tips for the holidays. Intention, salah, controlling of gaze, and effective time management. There are two more. We'll discuss number five before the end of this program. And we'll discuss number six next week, inshaAllah. May Allah tabarak wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. We now move on to our story for the week. Last week we spoke about uh, the story of Umar radiallahu an, and that there was this man who was nice and, uh, nice and well built, tall, big physique. So he stood out in the crowd. And he used to visit uh, the gatherings of Umar radiallahu an frequently. And uh, then after a while he stopped attending. And Umar radiallahu an inquired. And this is a great quality also of, of a leader. When you see somebody is not around, you inquire. You don't think, ah, well, so many other people are coming to my gathering. So many other, other people are coming to my majlis. So many other people are coming to me for help and assistance. If this person is not coming, that's his business. Why must I worry? But no, great leaders worried about every individual that they could possibly worry about. So... He went uh, and, and he made a few inquiries and somebody told him, unfortunately, Amir al-Mu'minin, we are actually uh, uh, embarrassed to inform you that this person is taken to drinking, this person is taken to alcohol. So Umar radiallahu an had many options. Umar radiallahu an was a firm man. He could have summoned him. He could have forced him to admit. He could have uh, executed uh, the penal law. He could have implemented uh, the had, as we call it. The man would have been lashed. He would have been embarrassed. But Umar radiallahu an decided to take a, a different route. A very tactical man. A, a very uh, wise man was Umar radiallahu an. And, and therefore he was such a great leader. He wrote him a letter as we discussed last week. Min Umar ibn al-Khattab ila fulan ibn fulan. This is from Umar ibn khattab to so and so. And then he just quoted the, the verses, the opening verses of uh, Surah Ghafir. Hamim tanzilu al-kitabi min Allah al-Aziz al-Alim. Ghafir al-Dhambi wa qabil al-Tawbi shadeed al-Iqab al-Tawl. He reminded him that Allah is the one who forgives sins. Allah accepts repentance. But at the same time, Allah is severe in punishment. So the message from Umar an to this man was very simple. Umar an was saying to him, listen, you've put yourself into a position where you are disobeying Allah. You've put yourself into a position where you are breaking the commands of Allah. Wa you've put yourself into a position where you are transgressing the limits of Allah. But don't become despondent. Allah is most willing to forgive. Allah is most willing to clean the slate and for, to allow for you to start again. However, don't let that become, uh, allow you to become complacent. Because Allah is also shadid al-iqab. When Allah does ultimately take punishment, then Allah takes severe reckoning and Allah takes severe punishment uh, on a, or executes severe punishment on a person. When the man read the letter, he immediately understood and he repented and he, uh, he, he reformed himself. And Umar radiallahu told people, this is how you deal with a person who's lost his way a bit. Today we get all feisty and we get all uh, hot and bothered and we become very aggressive in our approach and we say right is right and this is deen and we'll tell him what is right and he must know what is right. What's the objective? Is the objective to lecture the person? Is the objective to degrade the person? Is the objective to speak to the person in a condescending way where you belittle him and you make him feel very small? Or is the objective to get the person to change? Because every human's got an ego, you know. And sometimes you, you speak in a very condescending manner to the person. You treat him in a very heavy-handed manner. What happens is that then that person, uh, he digs in his heels. He becomes more stubborn and obstinate because his ego kicks in. So 
you've conveyed the message, but you haven't uh, achieved any objective because uh, uh, the person is still doing the sin. So he'll say, mind your own business and who are you to judge me and uh, wash, uh, you know, sweep your own doorstep before you want to do that, uh, sweep the, the doorstep of others. So be very, very uh, wise and, and be very thoughtful when you approach someone who's involved in some sin. So that's the story that we discussed last week. The story that I want to discuss this week is with regards Nu'man bin Thabit rahimahullah. Have you heard this name Nu'man bin Thabit rahimahullah before? Nu'man bin Thabit rahimahullah is none other than the great jurist and the well-known faqih Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Now Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah was a businessman of note as well. He wasn't only a jurist of note, although I mean his service through jurisprudence and fiqh has, has done the world a great service and has done, uh, uh, has the, he's done tremendous khidma to the deen of Islam as a result. However, Imam Hanifa rahimahullah, due to being a businessman, Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala had blessed him with wealth and he used to help people, not, even, not only Muslims, even non-Muslims. Imam Hanifa rahimahullah used to help them. So there was a fire worshipper who had taken a loan from Imam Hanifa rahimahullah and uh, he wasn't paying. So one day Imam Sab went to claim his haq, to claim his right. And as he's coming now to this man's house, he's just outside his door, some impurity gets stuck on his foot. And as he tries to scrape the impurity of his foot, it splatters onto the wall of the house of this fire worshipper who owes Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah money. Now Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah is in a predicament. If he leaves the impurity on the wall, it will leave a unsavory stain. And he tries to scrape it off, Maybe some of the paint and some of the cement will come off in the scraping process and he'll damage the wall. So while he's standing there, the servant comes to the door. Can I help you? Imam Muhanifa rahimahullah says to, say to your master, I'm here. So when uh, the fire worshipper comes out, he says, hey, is this guy no man, I owe him money. So now the excuses are flowing one by one. So Imam Muhanifa rahimahullah says, this, that, that money you owing me, let's leave that uh, one side for a moment. You know what, man, by mistake, I, uh, I, uh, I soiled your wall. I dirtied your wall. How are we going to remove this now, this impurity without damaging the wall? This man was totally taken aback. He was dumbstruck. He was floored. And he said, what? I'm owing you money. You could have come here and banged on the door and demanded your money. But that has become a side issue. You've put that on the back burner. And you are so considerate that you're worried about how to remove the impurity from the wall without scraping off some point, some paint and damaging the wall further. You know what? I have now realized that before purifying the wall, I need to purify my soul. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is how Islam spread. Good character. When you see to the well-being of others, it touches the cords of the heart. And it leads to the triumph of, of truth uh, over, um, over falsehood. But when you are oppressive, you, when you are hurtful, when you are inconsiderate, then even though you may be in the right, the person owes you the money, but you don't, you don't make uh, any, uh, any progress. You don't succeed. You don't, uh, you don't manage to go further and go ahead simply because your conduct is wrong. And this is what Imam Muhannifa rahimahullah had learned from Sahaba, who, who in turn had learned it from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Beautiful akhlaq and beautiful character. Being considerate of other people. Not trampling upon their rights if they had trampled upon your rights. This man had uh, trampled upon the rights of Imam, Imam Hanifa rahimahullah. In the sense that uh, he was not paying on time. Matarul ghani dhulmun. The derailment of uh, payment by an able debtor is oppression. But yet Imam Hanifa rahimahullah was so considerate of him. And this great character is what made great men. So if you want to be great, you can never be great unless you have, uh, you have brought greatness into your character. May Allah make us great in character. Ameen Ya Rabbul Alameen. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. We move on to our marital tip for the week. Last week we said, give your spouse a break during the holiday. Give your spouse uh, a holiday. Yeah, you know, sometimes uh, as a man, maybe for some reason you can't get leave. You can't, uh, you can't close your shop. You're very busy. But don't say, now, okay, my wife, you must also be uh, very busy now because I'm busy. I know of many men, they would uh, make arrangements for their wives to go on holiday with the children in the company of mahrams, obviously, in a very responsible manner, and they will pay for it. They'll say, my wife has worked hard the whole year taking care of my affairs. For some reason, I can't take a break. Why can I not give her a break? Now, many women 
who would say that, okay, my husband, maybe you can't afford a holiday, but we'll give you a break in the house. We'll pamper you for two or three weeks. No running around, no rush hour traffic, no stress, no deadlines, no moaning and groaning of the boss. You relax at home. You work hard the whole year to bring in the money, to provide for us, to ensure that we have shelter, we have clothes, we have food, uh, children have access to education, uh, we have all the luxuries that we want, so we are going to pamper you. So give your spouses during that holiday period, as we discussed last week, some, some space, some uh, freedom, give them a bit of a break, uh, send your wife for a while to her sister's house, send her for a while to, your, to her mother's house, send her for a while to mix with her family and her mahrams, the wife should also maybe allow him now, it's holidays, so allow him a little bit more time with his friends, a little bit more time for fishing, a little bit more time for golf, a little bit more time for chit-chat uh, after Salah in the masjid parking lot, as long as it doesn't get uh, out of control. Understand it's a holiday and understand that you don't want to put too much pressure on your spouse during the holiday. Now, having said that, I want to follow up that particular tip of last week, marital tip, uh, again, very relevant to the holiday period on the same theme. With the, with the tip for this week, and that is monitor your spouse during the holiday. Monitor your spouse during the holiday. What do we mean by this? We don't mean, we don't mean now you must be like a school monitor. You know, in school, I don't know if they have it nowadays. Uh, certain students used to get uh, selected uh, by the school administration, principal, teachers, etc. And they used to become monitors and they used to get a badge and they used to be referred to as monitors. So then you had a monitor, and then you had the vice, uh, what do you used to call it? The head boy and the deputy head boy, and then you had the head girl and the deputy head girl. And whoever became the head boy, I mean, hey, that guy was now, that was the man. And uh, the head girl, I mean, she had a lot of prestige and honor. Somewhere, I think somewhere along the line, I made it to position of monitor. I don't think I, no, no, definitely wasn't head boy or, or deputy head boy, but uh, I was monitored at some point or the other. I, I remember having the badge. And uh, you had to return the badge at the end of the year. And you got a chance about to, hey, where are you going? Hey, you know, are you topping? You, because you had, some, uh, you had some authority. Very little, but you had some authority because you were a, uh, a monitor. Now, uh, we don't mean a monitor in that particular sense. No, what it means is that, for example, sometimes your husband lies at home. Maybe he gets a bit lax with his salah, so you monitor him. Your wife, because it's holiday, now, hey, maybe that scarf, you know, now and then it just slips back and now and then it slips off. Maybe she's a bit lazy to put on the cloak because it's holidays. No, now we're in Durban and relaxing. No, you need to monitor your spouse. We're on holiday, very compassionately, very kindly, uh, with a lot of wisdom. Monitor and ensure that they don't transgress the limits of Allah. That's what we mean by monitoring. Because as I said earlier on, you know, festive season, festive mood, holiday, all of this has an impact on our psyche and sometimes we can become a little too complacent, a little too re relaxed, a little too free going. So monitor your spouse uh, in terms of number one, not breaking the commands of Allah Taala, and number two, not just wasting too much time and uh, doing things that uh, are not really constructive and, and just floating. And number three, make sure they don't do anything which is destructive. Unfortunately, this is also something which is prevalent in our communities, men going out and uh, consuming liquor, getting involved in drugs, women doing funny, funny things nowadays. So monitor your spouse during the holidays. That yes, we're going to have a bit of a break. Yes, we're going to do it in a manner which is pleasing to Allah wa ta'ala, in a manner which is constructive and productive, and in a manner which is going to assist us towards our overall objective, uh, and not in a manner which is displeasing to Allah wa ta'ala. May Allah grant us the understanding. <laughs>
that's not being considered. Yes, sometimes the chef might come from a slightly different cultural background. He might not enjoy eating the foods that you eat. Then uh, that's a different matter. But make some arrangements for the, for the food of the chef. And if the chef does um, enjoy, then don't leave the leftovers for him. You know, if something stays over, we give. Or whatever the children don't eat, we give. No, no, that's not right. Take out something from the beginning and say, look, if there's an issue of mahram, etc., and the chef can't sit with you on the, meal, on the table and share the meal, then uh, give it separately and let them eat it separately. The same as we explained last week goes for domestics. Uh, the domestics might not necessarily be preparing the meal, but uh, the domestics are in the house, in the kitchen, walking in and out when your wife or your daughter is preparing or your mother is preparing the meal and they're getting the nice aroma. So what happens? You eating chicken and you give your domestic pup and you eating chicken and you give your domestic b b b b b butter and bread and you say you eat that. Again, there might be some foods that the employer eats that um, is not enjoyed by the employee because the employee might come from a different cultural background. That is understood. But uh, if, if they do eat the same foods, then give them and take out from, for them from the beginning. You're eating nice lychees, it's now fruit season, you're eating watermelon, you're eating mangoes, but uh, you don't give your, your domestic. And uh, you want to give them the scraps, what's, ever, what's left over after you've eaten. That is incorrect and contrary to the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, we move on and we're talking about sleeping after meals. Make the digestion process simpler by engaging in dhikr or engaging in salah after partaking of meals. And then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa said further, do not sleep after meals as this create hard, it creates hardness in the heart, meaning spiritual hardness. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa has told us two things, that after you eat, try and make some dhikr or perform some salah and don't go to bed immediately after you eat. Don't go, if you rest in the afternoons, don't go to bed immediately after you've had lunch. If you're having a late supper, don't go to bed immediately after you've had supper. Why? Spiritually, it's detrimental. It creates hardness in the heart. And Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah and many other ulama and I suppose doctors also have written that physically it's detrimental to your physical health uh, as well. That's why some ulama have spoken about taking 40 steps before you sleep. Others have spoken about taking 100 steps. But you need to allow for the digestion process to kick in. That's why making some dhikr, that will assist you in that uh, regard. Performing salah after having uh, taken some meals, it will assist you in that, uh, in that regard. But uh, remember, it's detrimental spiritually and it's detrimental physically to just uh, eat and go immediately to the bed. And now also holiday season, sometimes what happens? Eat and immediately on the couch, remote in the hands. Couch potato, as they would, uh, they would call it. Uh, that's not healthy. Try and walk a little bit. Try and ensure there's some movement after you have, uh, you have taken your meals. Sometimes people, not only when they're in a relaxed mode, it's not only on Saturday and Sunday and holidays, sometimes because you're at work, you know, you, you're so, so up to your eyeballs in, uh, in work that you're eating, you're eating at your desk and you're continuing with work. So you're eating and you're just sitting. Uh, let there be eating and let there be a, a movement as well. Take a bit of a walk, take a few steps after you eat. Inshallah, it will be good for you spiritually as well as physically. May Allah Taala grant us the understanding. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. When we commenced the program in the introduction, I recapped what we have discussed in the previous weeks as far as tips for the holidays are concerned. And we spoke about the four points. Niyya, Salah, controlling the gaze and time. We've elaborated on that enough, alhamdulillah. Now this point number five, and this is a very important one, and this is with regards friends. Now, when we talk about friends, generally speaking, even if it's not in the context of holidays, then uh, the elder amongst us tend to look at the younger amongst us. They tell those youngsters, you know, those youngsters sitting there, tell them, tell them that uh, they, they mustn't uh, get involved with the wrong friends. Peer pressure is not something which is exclusive to younger people. Even middle class, even adult people uh, suffer from the consequences of uh, peer pressure. Abu Talib, you know the story of Abu Talib is really a sad story. Uh, I for one, and I'm sure many other Muslims as well, when you discuss the story of Abu Talib, you, re you really feel really sad. Because he was a man who did everything and more that he could for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A man who was prepared to sacrifice his own life. I mean, who's ready for the three years of excruci excruciating punishment that they went through in the Sha'bi Abi Talib when they were boycotted for three years? But Abu Talib did it in solidarity with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet he passed away without Iman. Why? Why did he pass away without Iman? Because of the peer pressure at the time. 
they would, his friends were telling him, hey, you will be remembered as a person who turned his back on the way of his forefathers. And that's why he said, ala millati, uh, ala, ala millati Abdul Muttalib, that no, I want to be on the, on the way of my forefathers. And he did not accept uh, the invitation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihum, that say la ilaha illallah and you will be successful. So friends for youngsters and all circumstances obviously very very important. Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran al-Karim Al-Akhillau yawma idhin ba'aduhum li ba'adin aduwun illa al-muttaqeen That on the day of Qiyamah every friend will become an enemy to his friend except those who have taqwa. Those who are friends for the pleasure of Allah. There is a narration of Ali radiallahu anhu when he mentions that if two people are friends for the pleasure of Allah Whenever they meet, they meet to do that which is uh, pleasing to Allah. Whenever they depart, they depart on terms which are pleasing to Allah. If the one dies, when he goes and Allah tells him that you are going to Jannah, he says, oh Allah, I've left behind a friend who used to motivate me to good. Oh Allah, let him die also a good death so he can join me in Jannah. And if two friends were friends in the disobedience of Allah, when the one dies and Allah tells him you have to go to Jahannam now to pay for your wrongdoings, He'll say, Wallah, I left a friend back in the world. He was always motivating me and assisting me in doing wrong. Let him die a bad death so he can join me in Jahannam. So that's friends. Youngsters need to be very careful. I, for one, am very, 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 very uncomfortable with youngsters, uh, young boys, young girls going for holiday with their friends only. I know it's become a norm. You know, youngsters don't want to move with their parents. Hey, these parents are too old. When we go for holiday with them, they just want to make kala kala. They want to visit here, visit there, visit everywhere. And we want to do our things. When you leave them alone, peer pressure. Sometimes you may have brought up your son well, your daughter well. But now they go and everybody else is doing it. So you also get uh, caught up. And even adults. Sometimes when you go on holiday, when you go on trips, uh, when you go for a picnic, you go in a group. Be careful who you go with. Because if those women now are throwing off the scarves, even though they have scarves at home, now you feel, hey, maybe I can also take off the scarf. You actually take off the scarf to fit in. You would feel very shy to go into a movie theater with your cloak or with your kurta or with your beard. But if now you've gone with a group of people who are doing it, so you also feel now that uh, you can do it. So choose friends, choose friends who will assist you in staying focused will assist you in the obedience of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. This is a principle at all times in life, but this is a principle more so uh, during, during the holidays. Somebody once Abdul, answered Abdullah bin Mubarak rahimahullah, that uh, you seem to be always on your own. Don't you get bored? So he said, how can I get bored when I always have a book? Wa khayru jaleesin, the best, the best friend, the best friend can be a book. Read something uh, Read something which is uh, productive, read something which is good. Let that be your company. You know, as, as what they say, that's expression in English, that uh, a bad friend uh, is, uh, no friend is better than a bad friend. And, uh, you know, the best obviously is to have, uh, uh, is to, is to have a good friend. So uh, the person who, uh, who can steal your mind is no less evil than that person who can steal your money. That person who leads you towards evil is an evil person. So beware and be wary. Of uh, of uh, evil people. May Allah Tabaraka wa Taala grant us the understanding. Welcome back to Friday Night Live. This brings us now to the end of the program. As always, you know, we appreciate uh, your feedback. Uh, I uh, S M R S for Suleiman, M for Muhammad, R for Ravit at ITV Networks TV. Uh, Twitter, at Suleiman Ravit. Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash Suleiman Ravit. And uh, the website, SuleimanRavit.com. That's SuleimanRavit.com. These tips that I'm discussing with you, these six tips, if you go onto the website, SuleimanRavit.com, you'll find them there. There's one more tip that we have to discuss, and we'll discuss that in next week's program, inshallah. So the Gregorian year, uh, year almost coming to an end. It's a time for reflection also. We need to ask ourselves the question that another year is passing in my life. Is it a year that has brought me closer to Allah or not? Remember the statement of Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu anhuma, which I discussed uh, just uh, earlier on in the program. He says, if a day passes that, uh, that, uh, that didn't bring me closer to Allah, that's a day of regret in my life. So if a year passes and that year didn't bring us closer to Allah and we haven't done anything constructive and productive, then that has to be a, a, a year of regret. So we must reflect and whatever good we have done, we attribute it to Allah. Whatever wrong we have done, 
we attribute it to ourselves. And also at the same time, we must ask Allah for the coming year to be a much better year than the year that has passed. Who knows? Who knows? It may just be the last year that uh, we are going to be alive this coming year. There's nothing we can take for granted. Many will celebrate the new year. As Muslims, we have our celebrations and we have a very particular method of celebrating. And the beginning of the Gregorian year is not uh, any, for, any, any mo a moment of celebration for us. So we don't need to get caught up in all of that. Uh, we need to be... We need to remain true to our identity as Muslims and we need to, be, we need to feel proud with what Allah wa Taala has blessed us with because Allah wa Taala says very emphatically and categorically اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا I'm the one who perfected this deen of yours, uh, Islam and I'm the one who's happy that you follow this deen so why must we be happy with something else which is beyond the scope of that which Allah is happy with so New Year will come and go, people will get drunk and they'll go and uh, waste a lot of money and do many silly things. But we don't need to get caught up uh, in all of that. We are not trend followers, we set our own trends. So keep in touch, inshallah, we, we request your du'as. Kullu am wa antum bi khair, may every year be a good one for you. Until we meet again, fi amanillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. من لا يفرج كرب المات يضنينا ويزرع الورد فينا والرياحينا وينشر الهدياء إيمانا وموعظة فبالجهالة قد خابت مساعينا تاحينا وينشر الهدياء إيمانا وموعظة فبالجهالة قد خابت مساعينا